you have your Bibles this morning, you turn with me over to Ephesians chapter 3. If you don't have your Bible or you left it at home, there's one in the chair rack in front of you. We're going to look at Ephesians chapter 3, Paul's prayer to the church. Before the term megachurch was ever even thought of, was ever even conceived, a great pastor by the name of Charles Spurgeon pioneered one in London, England. And when he was just 20 years of age, he pastored the New Park Street Church in London. And they called him to be their pastor. The church had great success. They outgrew the facility where they were at, and they built the Metropolitan Tabernacle. And that tabernacle had 6,000 seats in it. And every single Sunday, they packed the Metropolitan Tabernacle with 6,000 seats two times. People would line up at least an hour or two before the service just to get into this tabernacle to do two things. One, feel the presence of God and know that He was with them. And two, hear the powerful words of Charles Spurgeon as he shared the gospel of Jesus Christ. Charles Spurgeon is referred to as the Prince of Pastors because of his success. Because of his success, people would come from around the world and they would want to experience the, move, the mighty move of God there at the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London. And one particular Sunday, there were five college students who were in college studying to be a pastor. They showed up. Charles Spurgeon got word of that. As the masses lined up before they opened the doors, he went and found those five young men and asked them why they were there. And they said they wanted to find out what the power was in the Metropolitan Tabernacle. So Charles Spurgeon asked if they'd like to see the powerhouse of the church. Of course, they were excited because they thought that they were going to be taken into Charles Spurgeon's office and he was going to share with them this great wisdom. But instead, he led them down a long hallway down into the bottom of the church and stood before two doors. He asked the five young men, are you ready? Are you sure you are ready to see the powerhouse of this church? And they almost as if standing on the edge of the cliff waiting to die said, of course, of course. They couldn't wait to see what was about to happen. Charles Spurgeon opened those doors and inside that room was about 700 members of their church praying and asking for God's blessing upon the services that were about to take place. The five were astonished and taken back. And they asked Charles Spurgeon, well, what are the programs that you use at your church? What are the things that you do at your church? And he assured them that there was nothing that was more powerful. There was nothing that was driving the engine of the church other than those 700 people who had gathered before the service to pray. They asked further, and Charles Spurgeon said, we meet daily to pray for this church. And that alone is why God is blessing this ministry. <coughs> Rick Warren, the megachurch leader of our time, said a prayerless ministry is a powerless ministry. He went on further to say that a prayerless church is a powerless church. And if God's people is to be great, and plans to do great things for God, then it, mu it must be a church that is prayed for, and it must be a church where its members pray often. So where do we go to Scripture to find this? Where do we go in Scripture to find what it is that Rick Warren is talking about? Where do we go in Scripture to find what it is that Charles Spurgeon described as the powerhouse of his church? One passage of Scripture that I've been studying for well over a year and reading over and over and over and over is Ephesians chapter 3. And it's Paul's prayer for the Ephesian church, the church in Ephesus that Paul himself founded. It's also from that prayer where we gathered our theme this year for our church of imagine the more and these passages of Scripture in uh, the end of this prayer in Ephesians chapter 3. 
This morning we're going to dive into Paul's prayer in Ephesians chapter 3. It starts in verse 14. The first thing though that Paul prays for, the first thing that Paul prays for in the Ephesus church is for strength. Look at verse 14. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Again, the first thing that Paul prayed for, for the church in Ephesus, the church that he followed, the church that he birthed, the church that he cared for deeply, it was he was willing to give his life for, was for strength. Now, if you dig into the Apostle Paul's prayer, the one thing that Paul was focusing on was the inner being. You might have heard it as inner strength. It's no secret that we believe that this body, each of our bodies, is made up into three different parts. There's the body. That is our physical being. That's what we can all look at. And that's what each and every one of us sees. And so the picture that you have of someone is the picture of their physical being, their body. When you think of someone, you probably think first maybe of their face, or their, their body, their physical being. The next part is the mind. That's where our intelligence comes from. That's our thinking. That's our personality. We've got the body, we've got the mind, and then we've got the soul. The soul is what is eternal. The soul is what differentiates us from any other thing in God's creation. A lot of people think that we are no more different than a bunch of monkeys. But what differentiates us from the monkeys is that we have a soul that's going to live on eternally. We are going to live eternally somewhere. So we've got our body, we've got our mind, and we've got our soul. And Paul is saying in this prayer, your strength shouldn't come from your body. Your strength shouldn't come from your mind. Your strength, he says, has to come from your inner being. It's got to come from the depths of your soul. Plants, they have a body, and that's it. You've never heard of a plant having to be on some type of medication because it's a little depressed or it had a bad day or anything. Plants only have a body. Animals, on the other hand, they've got a body and they've got a mind. But animals don't have a soul. Animals can think, they can reason, and they can do different, thing, different things. But we have all three. Because we were made different from all of other creation in the image of God. And that then gave us something that will live on eternally. That inner being. You see, this tint of a body, this mind which fails us, they're temporary. They're going to pass away. 2 Corinthians 4.16, Paul said, Therefore, don't lose heart. Though outwardly, we're wasting away. Have you ever felt like that? You don't have to raise your hands. I'll raise both of mine. I've been walking in the evenings. Last night after I walked, I felt like my body was wasting away. My feet specifically. Paul said, this body is wasting away. So this body, Paul says, it's going to come to an end. But the scripture doesn't end with that. He said, yet inwardly, inside of us, our inner being, our soul, he says, is being renewed day by day. My mind might fail me, and it does. My body is wasting away, and it is. But my soul, Paul said, that inner being, what will live inside of me eternally, is being renewed day by day. That alone should give us comfort. That alone should encourage us. We're forgetting things. We're, we're, we're not, you lose your keys, you lose your cell phone, you, you forget which side of the bed you sleep, what, whatever. Your mind wasting away, your body is failing you, it seems like there is no hope. But Paul said your hope is in your inner strength. Your hope is in your inner being. That which is being renewed day after day after day. The outer, it's temporary. 
The hour is going to return back to the dust of the earth. And so the question that I want to ask you this morning is, why is it that we focus on the hour so much? Why are we worried about this outside shell of a body so much? Of our body, soul, and our mind, what is it that you think is most important? Is it your appearance? Is it your body? Is it how strong your mind is? Is it what you made on the last test you took? Or how smart you are and how much of a scholarship that you'll be able to receive someday? Is that what's most important to you? Or is it that which alone will live eternal? Your inner being, the very soul that God gave to each and every one of us. Now I want to take it one step further. And I want to ask you another question this morning. Which did you, of those three, which did you spend the most time on this morning getting ready for church? Did you spend more time on the hour? Or did you spend more time on the soul? The hour is temporary. The hour is going to pass away someday. The hour does not even matter to God. It's the soul that matters to God. If you spent 30 minutes standing in front of a mirror this morning, did you spend 30 minutes on your knees with God, preparing your soul for what God had for you this morning? What's more important to you? The outer or the inner? We focus on this outer shell. And to determine that, you can look at what we pray for. We're worried about all kinds of different things. We pray for kidneys, we pray for legs, we pray for toenails, we pray for spleens. We pray for all of this physical stuff that Paul is telling us is going to pass away. How many times do we pray for our soul? How many times do we pray for our soul to be strengthened? How many times do we ask God, God, don't worry about my body. Don't worry about my mind that's failing me. This body is wasting away. But God, what I want to come to you and alone I want to ask for this morning is for my soul, that which will live eternally, to be strengthened. Which is more important to you? Is it the outer or is it the inner being, your very soul that God gave to you? Now, it's not wrong to be worried about the physical. I'm not saying that we, we need to stop praying for the physical. Because God is concerned about that. Because if you have a concern, He concerns Himself with that. And so God hears our prayers and God answers our prayers. And I still believe that we serve a miracle working God. But my point this morning is that this is temporary. Your soul is not. And too many times we spend too much time on the outer and forget about the inner. And what God wants us to do is to place our soul above everything else. And if that's the order in which you're living your life, then you're doing well. 1 Peter 3, 3 and 4 says this, Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as braided hair and the wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. He doesn't say that those things are bad. He goes on to say, instead, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. So this morning, how is your soul? How is your soul? I can't answer that question for you. I can look at your physical being. And I can tell whether you spend any time in front of the mirror or not this morning. But I cannot look deep in your soul and tell you how much time you spend with God. I can, however, see your actions. I can, however, see how your inner being affects your mind. And your relationship with God changes the way that this earth wants us to think. How is your soul this morning? How is your soul? In Romans 7.21, it says, So I find this law at work. Paul's telling about the struggle that he has between his mind, his body, and his soul. When I want to do good... Evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, my soul, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, 
waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am, Paul says. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see there in Romans chapter 7, Paul addresses the three aspects of man. The body, the mind, and the soul. And then we get over to Ephesians when Paul is praying for the, uh, the church in Ephesus. And Paul, the first thing he prays for is inner strength that the soul of the church would be lifted up. So therefore, our first prayer for our church, for our brothers and sisters in Christ, should be strength for their soul. Just as Paul said, for this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. We're going to come back to that part. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Before Paul addressed anything else, he addressed the strength of the inner soul. And then he goes on to say in verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now these were already believers. He wasn't praying that these people would get saved. He was praying specifically and used the Greek word for dwell. That literally means to settle down and feel at home. The word dwell just doesn't mean to take up residence. It means much more than that. It means to settle down and feel at home. Listen, the girls and I just got back from a vacation. Vacations are great, and we all need to take vacations. And even though we stayed with my mom, it still wasn't home. You still just can't settle down at somebody else's house. You can't do whatever you want to do at somebody else's house. It's just not home, and so you just feel a little bit different. Even though it's a parent, even though it's a close family or a close friend, you might not feel necessarily always at home. There's just something about being at home. To settle down and be at home. To feel at home. Sleeping in your own bed. Sitting in your own recliner. Getting your own things out of your own... There's just something about being at home. And Paul is praying for the Ephesus church that God would be at home in their hearts. Think about that. Paul is asking, pray for this church, that God, Jesus Christ, would be at home in their hearts. How many of you have ever got a phone call? You don't have to raise your hands on this either. But you've ever gotten a phone call and somebody says, hey, we're going to, we're in town and we're going to stop by your house. We'll be there in about 10 minutes. Is that okay? And in your mind, you're saying, no, <clears throat> go somewhere else. <laughs> Spend a little more time at the restaurant. Can you come tomorrow morning? And you say, yes. And you hang up the phone and it's just a madhouse. Everything that's sitting around goes under the bed, in the closet, in the bathtub, under the couch, wherever you can find a drawer, a cabinet. And then you hear the doorbell ring, you grab a towel and wipe all the sweat off of you, and you say, it's so good to see you. And if they only knew those last few minutes that you spent in complete chaos, so if Paul is praying for the Ephesus church that God would be able to settle down and feel at home, what Paul is praying is that when Jesus calls and says, I'm coming over to your house, you don't all of a sudden have to feel ashamed and spend that time from when you hang up with Jesus on the phone and Jesus rings your doorbell doing a whole lot of cleaning and getting rid of stuff that Jesus isn't going to be happy about. Paul is saying, you need to live your life with strength in your inner being 
so that Jesus is comfortable enough to settle down in your soul and feel at home. There's another passage of Scripture that says we need to get rid of every sin and weight that would lead us astray from Jesus Christ. Paul is praying for inner strength. And he is praying that Jesus is so comfortable with the saints of the church in Ephesus that Jesus wants to dwell with them. I ask you again this morning, how is your soul? How is your soul? Is your soul so good with God that Jesus would want to settle down and feel at home with your soul? How's your soul this morning? Let's read verses 17, 18, and 19. He says, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with the saints, to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ, and to know His love that surpasses knowledge. I wish that we could grasp that love that God has for each and every one of us. I wish that we could really begin to understand how huge God's love is for us. That nothing you could ever do and nothing you could ever say would make God love you any less. It's always God that is begging for your soul to come to Him. That is standing there just motioning you into Him. Your body is going to fall. Your body is fading away. Your mind is failing you. But it's that inner soul that God is constantly drawing in and drawing in and drawing in. Because He loves you that much. And so Paul is saying to the Ephesus church, I wish you could grasp how wide and uh, how long and how high and how deep is the love of God for you. And to know this love that surpasses all knowledge. So that you would be overflowing with God's love. Go back and look at the beginning of Paul's prayer. Back to verse 14 and 15. These verses, I've probably read them over this past year or so several dozen times, maybe a hundred or more times. I, I don't know. But I keep going back to this verse and back to this verse and back to these two verses that Paul prayed for the church in Ephesus. And I ask God, God, you've got to, you've got to help me understand it. You've got to explain this to me. And even though I might have a little bit of understanding, I just want to understand it deeper. I want to have a deeper knowledge of what it is exactly that Paul is praying for this church here in Ephesus. And these two verses say this, For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And here's the part that just completely blows me away. He says, And whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Do you see what Paul is saying there? It might just seem like a couple of prepositions has got some words that come after it to you. But Paul is saying to the church in Ephesus, Listen, Listen to what he's saying. He is saying that all of us, the whole family of God, derive our name from Him. Then you get to several verses in, in, in verse 19 and Paul says, you've got to understand how wide and how deep God's love is for you. It surpasses all knowledge. And it links back to verse 15 where he says, listen, God put His name on you. That's how much God loved you. He adopted you and brought you into His family and gave you His name. And along with giving you His name, He gave you an inheritance that we could never begin to understand and certainly never work for. God placed His name on you. And then it's no coincidence that Paul used the Greek word for dwell that means that Jesus would settle down and feel at home inside of you. Because He gave you His name. It's no coincidence this morning we sang songs about the name of Jesus Christ. 
Jason and I didn't coordinate that. We didn't talk about that. But what God would say to us this morning is that there is an importance in a name. And your name must be built upon your relationship with Jesus Christ. It is not a light thing to be named of the Father. You can't take that lightly. The name that your father, your earthly father, gave you, it's a great name. But there is a name that is higher than any other name. Whereby all the world at some point will bow down and acknowledge this name. That is the name of Jesus Christ. And it is that name that Paul says that Jesus gave you when he settled down and he felt at home in the depths of your soul. That deserves a lot of thought. That deserves a lot of prayer. To think that God loved us so much that he gave us his name. In the scripture, God is referred to in Nehemiah as the terrible God. In Hebrews, it's a dreadful thing, it says, to fall into his hands. In Luke, God has got the power to throw a man's soul into the depths of hell. And in Hebrews 3, he is a consuming fire. You see, it is not a light thing to take on that name. And then to take on that name and worry about this body, to worry about our mind above the depths of our soul is failure. Paul says if you want to strengthen your soul, if you want Jesus to dwell, to settle down and feel at home inside of you, then you have to remember whose name it is that you are bearing. And then work, walk worthy of carrying the name of Jesus Christ. You want to be strengthened? You want to not worry about your body? You want to not worry about your mind? You want to not worry about all this physical junk that is around us? Then you have to focus on your soul. And the way you focus on your soul is by remembering whose name it is that we are carrying. We are called His sons and His daughters. There's over 148 times in the Scripture that we are referred to as God's children, as His son or as His daughter. God has offered to you a family that will live eternally. That won't be destroyed with your body. That won't be destroyed with your mind. But to be able for God to dwell with you inside of you and you to dwell with Him eternally, you have to carry that name. And the way that you do that is by focusing on the strength in your inner soul. The family of God far outpaces any other relationship that you will ever, ever have in your entire life. It's because we together carry the name of Jesus Christ. And if you are not a part of that family, God stands before you today extending to you an invitation for you to be adopted into His family so that He can dwell inside of you through the power of His Holy Spirit. So that He can dwell, settle down, and feel at home inside of you because you are a part of God's family. If you're driving along Interstate 10, from here, you go through, out through the Panhandle, you go through Alabama, you get into Louisiana. Just before you get into Louisiana, there's a billboard. It has a picture of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ who's hanging on a cross, and his head is bowed. Because of the crown of thorns, blood is flowing down from him. You see the nails that has pierced his hands. And he's hanging on this cross. And there's only three words that are on that billboard for all the drivers to see. It says, it's your move. It's your move. So this morning, I want to stand before you like that billboard. And I want to tell you this morning, it's your move. It's up to you this morning. If you want to still be worried about your body, if you still want to be worried about your mind, or you want to focus on strength for your inner soul, the only thing of you that will live eternally. 
It's your move, Jesus would say to you this morning. I also want to ask you, again, what is the state of your soul? Did you spend as much time this morning preparing your soul for the day as you did standing in front of the mirror? It's your move this morning. If you've never begun a relationship with Jesus Christ, or maybe you did years ago or some time ago, and then you got more worried about other things, or maybe something distracted you, you had something come up in your life, and you just weren't able to focus on Jesus anymore. But you understand the scriptures that we've studied and talked about here this morning. And you understand that your body's not important. You understand that your mind is not important. But you know that you've got a soul inside of you that's going to live on for all of eternity. <coughs> this morning, Jesus Christ stands before you, extending to you an invitation to come and walk in relationship with Him. He doesn't care where you've been. He doesn't care what you've done. He doesn't care how bad you have messed things up. The only thing that He cares about is the state of your soul. If that's you, it's your move this morning. It's your move to say, Jesus, I've messed up. And I want to ask you forgiveness. And I want to walk in relationship with you so that you can dwell in me. You can settle down in my soul and you can feel at home. Or maybe you've walked with God for years, decades maybe. And you've never really thought about it. Or maybe you've never really given much concern to Paul's prayer here for the Ephesians church. In that we have to remember that it's His name that we are carrying around with us. We have to remember it's, it's, it's how our soul's health is. It's how our relationship with Jesus Christ is. It's if Jesus can settle down in us and feel at home. Maybe you haven't you've walked with God and haven't focused much on your soul. This morning, it's your move. God hasn't changed. God hasn't moved. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And He is standing here for every single one of us this morning. Wanting to strengthen our inner being. Wanting to strengthen our soul. And for each one of us, it's our move. So this morning, again I ask you, how is your soul? How is your soul? I think that every one of us, and I'll be the first one to confess, every single one of us need our soul strengthened. Every single one of us need more and more and more and more of Jesus and less of us. Every one of us. And so this morning, as we sing here in just a few minutes, if these words have hit you, and if you have seen yourself somewhere in this Scripture, or, or the Holy Spirit has convicted your heart, I invite you this morning to come and kneel at these altars and just spend time with you and God, just the two of you, so that He can strengthen your inner soul, your inner being that will live for all of eternity. Would you stand with me this morning? God, we come to You and we just ask this morning that Your Holy Spirit would right now convict every single one of us. To speak to every single one of us. Me included. Every, every one of us, God. Me, our elders, those that are part of our church leadership team, all of the leaders of this church, every single one of us. Holy Spirit, speak to us this morning. Because we've got to have our inner soul strengthened. We've got to have that inner being strengthened today. So that you can settle down and feel at home inside each and every one of us. God, this morning, I just pray and ask that in our time that remains this morning, we're not focusing on anything else. We're not focusing on our body. We're not focusing on our mind. We're not focusing on our bills. We're not focusing on our phones. We're not focusing on our houses. We're not focusing on our family, our friends, or where we're going to eat lunch, or anything else that's going to happen in the rest of our lives. It's just us and you this morning. 
and you examining our soul, our inner being, that alone which will live for all eternity. Because what happens in the next few minutes can change eternity for somebody here this morning. And so God, we just stand up and fight that spiritual battle right now in the name of Jesus Christ, the name that we carry with us. God, this morning, strengthen souls. This morning, strengthen inner beings this morning. This morning, draw those closer to you that maybe don't know you or living out on the edge. God, this morning, let your spirit move in a very powerful way in this place so that our souls are strengthened. We are prepared to stand before you at the start of eternity. We ask all of this in the name, the name that is above every other name. It's the name of Jesus Christ. This morning, we invite you to come and kneel and pray if you'd like to. You don't have to come down and kneel at these altars unless the Spirit is leading you. What's more important than anything else this morning is that you allow God's Spirit to examine your soul right where you're at. And you say, God, I'm giving you freedom and I'm giving you permission to examine every bit of my being, every bit of my soul, so that you alone are glorified. And my eternal soul is ready for you to settle down and feel at home in. This morning, let God examine your soul. Give God that permission. Give God that freedom. Let God prepare for that alone to live for all eternity inside. As we see, let the Spirit speak to you.
today's belief, pray that Christ would fill you and strengthen your soul. Not your body, not your mind, but the inner being that Paul prayed for, your soul, the Ephesus church. Don't forget at 2 o'clock, church picnic, the directions back there to Rainbow Springs. We hope to see you there. Let's pray. Father, as we go from here this morning, we just lift you up. We praise you. We worship you. We thank you for giving us the privilege of being able to carry your name. And it's a privilege that we don't take lightly. But let us live so that you are comfortable settling down and feeling at home in our soul. As we go from here today, Lord, strengthen our soul. Strengthen each and every one of our souls. And help us to remember that that is our first priority in life. Because it will live eternally. God bless us. Strengthen our souls. Keep your hand upon us. Keep us safe. In Jesus Christ's name we pray.